I would like to introduce to you, and next slide please. Thank you. I would like to introduce to you Ms. Tanya Pruitt, who is our Senior Director of the Office of Acquisition Operations and Solutions within the General Services Administration. Let's welcome Ms. Tanya Pruitt. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. Thank you so much, Antoinette. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, Thank great. you again for that kind introduction and for having me this morning. Um, I'm honored to be here with you again. I'm Tanya Pruitt, Senior Director here in ITC, Office of um, Acquisition Operations and Solutions. I want to um, just start by saying um, just thank you very much for inviting me to be here to open up uh, with opening remarks. This training we're giving um, to you all today is imperative to our success as we help our small business community. Um, I just wanted to point out that last year alone we had $37 billion in IT spend that came through our office. $24 billion of those dollars came from our GSA IT mass schedule program. I also wanted to share that over the past year, um, GSA has advanced equity and supplier diversity in the federal um, procurement um, process. As part of the administration's executive order and our GSA equity plan, our senior executive, Cheryl Thornton Cameron, who couldn't be with us today, is one of GSA's appointed primary designated representatives for the White House initiative on advancing um, educational equity, excellence, and economic opportunity in, for the federal interagency working group. So we are very committed in trying to ensure success for our small businesses, and it does take partnerships with you all um, to help us get there. Again, we are very excited to have you with us this morning and also be able to bring you this training and information so that you can help us in training others. Um, and I hope we have a great session today. And I'm going to turn it back over to you, Antoinette. Thanks again, and thank you to um, the panel that's going to be participating in the training. Thank you, Tanya, for that welcoming mm -hmm. remarks. Miguel, if you can go to the next slide. Awesome. Now we are fortunate to have four great presenters, GSA subject matter experts. We have Gail Smith, Isabella Osborne, Sandra Simmons, and Ryan Hagan. Gail Smith is a contract specialist in the information technology category of the uh, Federal Acquisition Service. Gail began her career with GSA in 2019 with the Utilization and Donation Division. In her current role, Gail reviews and award e-offers and contract modification in support of the multiple award schedule program. And we have Isabella Osborne. Is a contract specialist with the General Service Administration, Federal Acquisition Service, IT Solutions, Contract Division, Special Projects Branch. Isabella is a FACSI professional certification holder and is a proud Air Force veteran. Isabella holds a Master's of Science degree in clinical mental health counseling from Capella University and a Bachelor's of Science in psychology from the University of Phoenix. We also have Sandra Simmons. She began her federal service as a contract specialist at the U.S. General Service Administration, Federal Acquisition Service. Her primary responsibility involves administering complex high dollar contracts. One of Sandra's most rewarding projects involves serving as the unofficial Section 508 tester for some of GSA numerous applications. This helps to facilitate GSA's ongoing commitment to support all our customers by providing Section 508 compliant solutions. Lastly, we have Ryan Hagen. He's a Customer Service Director with the General Services Administration and supports our Navy accounts in Southern California. Ryan works with the Navy by helping them with market research reports, posting their RFIs or refuse on eBuy, 
and helps with the industry outreach to ensure sufficient in comp competition. In addition to his interest in service and leadership, Ryan has a strong entrepreneurial spirit. He recently completed a detail to the Asia Pacific case team and was an integral member of a project team that brought forward a successful business case analysis to expand GSA fleet support in Hawaii and Asia. Ryan holds a master's degree in an international relationship and affair from American University and a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of San Diego. Now we have a lot to cover. I think this will be a very informative discussion. So let's get started with the presentation from Gail, Sandra, Isabella, and Ryan. Gail, can you get us started? I sure can. Thank, Thank you, Antoinette, and, Antoinette, and, and hello, everyone. hello, everyone. My name is Gail My Smith, as Gail Antoinette, Antoinette just mentioned. mentioned. We have a wealth of knowledge for you today, so let's go ahead and hop right in. So a little background on the information technology category, ITC, which is where Isabel, Sandra, and I are from. Information technology category is one of the larger contracts in the federal government, and we offer a full suite of IT and telecommunications products, services, and solutions from highly qualified industry partners. Over 80% of the mass information technology suppliers are small businesses. GSA has a integrated technology category innovation division that sponsors monthly vendor outreach events where we invite industry partners, including newly established or startup companies, and companies that want to foster stronger federal government relationships. Part of this process is exchanging dialogue with the ITC subject matter experts, the Small Business Utilization Office, and other industrial um, disciplines in GSA. So during this process, ITC emphasizes vendors' categories, including emerging technologies, small businesses, small disadvantaged businesses, and so on. This, is, this has allowed us to continue meaningful conversations with our industry partners. And some of the current initiatives that are underway include our blanket purchase agreements, such as our two, second generation IT BPA, our 2JIT, Fastlane, and our startup springboard. On to the solicitation, the mass solicitation. So the GSA Multiple Award Schedule Program establishes long-term government-wide contracts with negotiated ceiling prices between commercial suppliers and the federal government and in some cases, state and local entities. So the mass contracts are pre-vetted, multiple award, indefinite delivery, and definite quantity contracts. These contracts are awarded with a five-year base period and a potential for three additional five-year option periods. You can think of GSA mass program as having a long-term business relationship with the federal agencies. The mass program offers contractors federal contracting opportunities exceeding 39 billion annually. Becoming a mass contractor, businesses will be able to sell products and services directly to government agencies using streamlined ordering procedures. So the multiple award schedule solicitation, it's posted on SAM.gov along with its attachments. Um, it's posted electronically. It's a standing solicitation, meaning that it's open continuous and vendors can submit offers at any time. The solicitation is updated or refreshed approximately three times, sometimes more a year, and the outline of the significant changes can be found in the SF SF30, excuse me, attached. So the GSA mass solicitation, here's a breakdown of the different various sections of the solicitation itself, is very imperative as an offer to read and understand the solicitation and the clauses that encompass the solicitation because after you're awarded, the clauses and things are, are what's going to pretty much be your terms and conditions to fall back on or if you have an issue or for compliance. So very important to read and understand the terms, conditions, clauses that encompass the solicitation. So becoming a mass contractor will allow businesses, as I mentioned, to sell products and services directly to the government agencies using a streamlined ordering procedure it allow you to maintain compliance with federal, relation, federal regulations and policies. That's why it's important to understand the clauses and terms that make up the solicitation and offer products and services at fair and reasonable prices. So when we get into the actual offerings, 
that are available under the multiple award schedule. That consists of 12 large categories that are displayed. The large categories are categories of available products, services, and solutions that are based on government-wide categories and consist of one or more subcategories. As mentioned before, each category attachment can be downloaded with the solicitation on SAM.gov. So here we have specifically the information technology categories, sub, well, subcategories. So these subcategories exist under the information technology category. As I said, each large category has its own subcategories that will be found in the attachments. So these subcategories further classify the offerings under the large category by the SIN number, special item number. The information technology category consists of six subcategories, which is IT hardware, software, services, telecommunications, training, and solutions. There's more on the next page. <laughs> um, so listed here, you'll see the uh, training solutions, continued solutions, and complementary. So there are three miscellaneous subcategories that apply to the information technology category as well. They will, are the new ancillary and OLM. And for specifics on those three, you can find them in the miscellaneous attachment. So here we have our transactional data and reporting. TDR is optional on the, under the multiple award schedule and is currently available for 63 cents. So for more information on the 63 cents, you can visit the GSA TDR page through the link found on the slide. And if an offerer chooses to participate in TDR, their proposed pricing will be compared to like or similar items and a pricing variability will be applied for negotiation. With TDR, the offerer does not submit the various discounts their company provides, nor is their pricing tied to a most favorite customer, or MFC. So offerers that choose to participate in TDR electronically report the price the federal government paid for an item or services purchased through contracts. TDR participants are not required to report commercial sales practices disclosures or to monitor the price reduction violations in accordance with GSTAR clause 552.238-81 price reductions. There are special proposal instructions for TDR participate, participants that are dis detailed in the solicitation. So be sure to note those under each section. So let's get into the basics of offer preparation and getting your offer ready for GSA. So when it comes to organizing your approach, you want to prepare by completing the assessments and registering for required systems. After that, you want to understand the SINs that you're proposing and their specific evaluation factors. Then you want to complete your market research, formulate your, your proposal. After that, you want to review your documents and ensure they're complete. That is a very important part. If they're not complete or you're missing anything, that could prolong the timeline for you getting a contract award. So to prepare, the Pathways to Success training helps determine whether obtaining a scheduled contract is in the offeror's best interest. It provides information on the GSA schedule program, expectations of contractors, how to compete and succeed as a scheduled contractor, how to develop a schedule specific business plan, and how to submit a quality offer. The readiness assessment is completed after the Pathways assessment by a company officer it helps ensure the business is ready to submit an offer under the right GSA large category, subcategory, and special item number. DocuSign is required for the duration of the contract for signatures. eOffer is a web-based application that allows offers to electronically prepare and submit a mass offer to the Federal Acquisition Service. Contractors must use a FAS ID multi-factor authentication to access eOffer. There's also the Section 889 and Trade Acts Agreement Compliance, which is required, and we will discuss those in the next slide. But first, Isabel has our first common mistake. Isabel? 
Thank you, Gil. So now let's take a look at a couple of key areas on the company SAM. Start by checking uh, things on your company system for award management SAM entity registration. One area is the SAM regulation. The offer must be registered with the system for award management. First, let's verify the registration date, which cannot be expired when submitting your e-offer and the date cannot expire prior to a contract award. And second, the SAM entity registration response to acceptance of credit cards, which is located under the financial information section. Contractors are required to accept credit cards for payments equal to or less than the micro purchase threshold. So when you get to the section asking, do you accept credit cards as a method of payment, please respond yes. A large percentage of government purchases are made with credit cards. Not checking the correct response could cost you sales. And last, look at your company's entity registration for proposed SINs. Please ensure the proper NAICS code for all proposed SINs are included. And for NAICS or SIN information, see Mass Available Offerings. All right, thanks, Isabella. So what is Section 889? Section 889 is a part of the Fiscal Year 2019 National Defense Authorization Act Part A specifies covered telecommunications equipment or services as a substantial or essential component of any system or as a critical technology as part of any system. It is prohibited from being procured or obtained or extended or renewed on a contract by federal government. Part B prohibits executive agencies from entering into or extending or renewing a contract with an entity that uses equipment, system, or services that uses covered telecommunications equipment or services as a substantial or essential component of any system or as critical technology as any system. For definition of covered telecommunications equipment or services, see FAR 4.2101. Isabella, let's discuss our next common mistake to avoid. Thank you, Gail. So now let's take a look at the SAM FAR DFAR report down and look down to the cover telecommunications equipment or services representation section. Please ensure the offer represents that it does not provide covered telecommunications equipment or services as a part of its offer products or services to the government in the performance of any contract, subcontract, or other contractual instrument, nor does not use covered telecommunications equipment or services or any equipment system. Common errors the offer may state does on both or one of the responses, but both need to be does not. All right, so what is TAA? What is the Trade Act Agreement? The Trade Act Agreement of 1979 was enacted to foster fair and open international trade. Under TAA, the products and our services offered on a GSA schedule contract are required to be only US made or TAA designated country and products. A list of those countries that are designated can be found at FAR 52.225-5. All GSA scheduled contractors must follow the Trade X agreement, meaning they agree each final product they sell has been substantially transformed in the U.S. or in a signatory country designated by the TAA. Although TAA compliant countries do not change very often, it is important to routinely check to make sure that you're abiding by the GSA's regulations. So on this slide, we have the new offer required documents. We have some links in here that'll help you along the way with downloading those templates. The list of documents that are on this slide are required for an offer submission. Some are applicable, some aren't, depending on what you're offering. The agent authorization letter, letter of supply, price proposal templates, and commercial sales practices can be downloaded through the links provided on the slide. The documents will vary as I mentioned, by sin. So when it comes to the financial statements that you will be providing or the offer will be providing for the offer, you must provide annual financial statements for the previous two years, audit it if available. The financial statements include balance sheets and income statements. If there's any negative financial information, the offer must provide an explanation. 
There is the optional documentation of a letter of credit or a certificate of competency. The certificate of competency, of course, is a certificate issued by the SBA stating that the business, the small business is responsible with respect to all elements of responsibility and has the capability to perform a specific government contract. All right, Isabella, got another one of those mistakes? Yes, Gail, just as you were saying, at a minimum, each financial statement must consist of a balance sheet and income statement. And the offeror must provide an explanation for any negative financial information disclosed, including negative equity or income. Please do not submit federal or state tax returns or bank statements. The requirement to provide financial statements does not apply to contractors that have an active FSS program contract under the schedule and meet the criteria for submitting a streamlined offer or offer submitted as a start springboard, which are companies that have less than two years of corporate experience. Keep in mind that if no financial statements exist, the contracting officer may request additional documentation that demonstrates the company's financial responsibility. Awesome. So if the offer is a dealer or reseller, if the offer is not the manufacturer of the product that is being offered, the offerer may only offer products it is authorized to distribute, either by the manufacturer itself or as otherwise authorized pursuant to a wholesaler agreement. The verified products portal enables authorized original equipment manufacturers and their wholesalers to fulfill the letter of supply requirement by providing supplier authorization information and detailed product content. If the manufacturer is a VPP participant, no letter of supply is required. The government will utilize available VPP data to ver verify that the offer is authorized to sell those proposed products and has access to an uninterrupted source of supply. The supplier authorization data in the VPP is authoritative and takes precedence over all other evidence to include letters of supply. If the manufacturer is not VPP a participant, the offerer must upload a letter of supply to the e-offer and failure to provide an acceptable, acceptable letter of supply may result in rejection of the offer. The letter of supply template can be found using the link on this slide. Isabella, tell us more about the letter of supply. Yes, thank you, Gil. So if you, the offerer, are not the manufacturer of the products being proposed, you need to provide an acceptable letter of supply. Required elements of the letter of supply vary based on the type of products you sell. The letter of supply must be on supplier company letterhead, and the supplier signature must be dated within 12 months of vendor submission to GSA. All right, so commercial agreements. The commercial supplier agreement terms are standard terms of sale or lease terms of service, end user license agreements, or other similar legal instruments or agreements. Just like with the letter of supply, these documents are needed to verify the offeror's ability and authority to distribute the products or software. So terms and conditions must be compliant with the FAR as they will undergo a legal review. And now I'll pass it over to Sandra for our offer responses document. Thank you, Gail. Okay, so when it comes to the offer responses document, basically think of the offer responses document as the foundation of the offer. As Gail and Isabella have previously indicated, there's some documentation that is gonna be required depending on the SIN, others that will not be required. However, the offer responses document is mandatory regardless of the SIN that is being proposed. Within the offer responses document, um, you will acknowledge having completed the um, pathways to success readiness assessment. Um, this is also the document where you'll designate which SINs are being proposed, your primary NAICS, which is the NAICS code where the preponderance of the work performed is going to fall. Um, you'll be able to also designate what type of delivery you'll be doing overseas, domestic, and you'll be able to specify 
per send the estimated sales under the send that each send that you're being proposed. You will also designate authorized negotiators. And I think Isabel is going to discuss some common mistakes. Thank you, Sandra. So there are five specific questions that you must respond to in this section, each of which relate to various ads, programs, or administrative issues relating to your GSA schedule contract offering. When you get to this section, there are a couple of areas that may seem to cause a lot of headaches. Keep in mind this section of the offer response document may be in a different order on your end. However, responses should be as follows. For disaster purchasing, the response should be yes. Many times I see no. I think the word dis disaster may indicate to some that the response should be no. However, under the disaster recovery purchasing program, state and local government entities may purchase a variety of products and services from contracts awarded under nuclear, biological, chemi and chemical attack. By selecting yes to participation in the disaster recovery purchasing program, your company becomes eligible to provide products or services in the event of a disaster. Next, exceptions to terms and conditions. This response should be no. Does the offer take exception to any of the terms and conditions presented in part two of the solicitation document? If yes is selected, the offer must provide documentation for each contract clause selected for exception. The exceptions the offer requests will be negotiated with the GSA contracting officials. And exceptions to certs and, and reps, the response should be yes. The offer representation and certification commercial items have been entered or updated in the last 12 months are current, accurate, complete, and applicable to this solicitation. If no is selected, the offerer must submit an attachment listing the paragraphs which have changed and identify after each paragraph what has changed. Please title the attachment. However, the submitted document titled exceptions to certs and reps does not identify what has changed. And Sandra? Okay, so letter of authorization. So within the offer responses document, you have the, this is gonna be where you designate who you'd like to serve as your authorized negotiator. Um, you definitely need at least one of the individuals, you need two individuals, at least two individuals, but one of them should work for the company. However, what you can also do is decide that you want to outsource. You want to engage the services of a consultant or third party. So if you decide that you're going to utilize the services of the third party, then you will need to include what's called a letter of authorization. The letter of authorization template is located within the solicitation. It must appear on corporate letterhead. And essentially what it does is it lets GSA know how we should go about interacting with these individuals. So for example, um, if they can, they can discuss offers, if GSA has a question, is in need of some clarifications, revisions, things of that nature, then we would reach out to that individual during the pre-award process. Then there's the negotiations. They can be part of the negotiations. And then for post-award, um, they can do such things as um, uploading modification requests. And if there's a modification that you have, we would be able to reach out to them to ask questions if we have any questions. They also have the ability from the post-award perspective to sign those mods that were previously uploaded. They have the authority to sign the modifications on behalf of the company. Um, and on the, on the slide is a link to where the template can be found. I think I'm passing it over to Isabel, who is going to discuss some other common mistake areas. Thank you, Sandra. In the e-offer system, you will have to complete the ad negotiator section. 
Offers should have at least two authorized negotiators who are authorized to sign, and one authorized negotiator must be an employee of the company. It is important to have more than one negotiator assigned to a contract. In the event that one negotiator is unavailable, you will have another assigned to the contract to ensure that a representative from your company can still sign off on agreements with the government. To add a negotiator, complete the mandatory fields as indicated in e-offer, including name, title, phone, and email. If your company has a consultant or third-party agent assisting in the preparation of the offer that will be involved in any part of the negotiation of the offer or will be involved in any post-award actions, the companies must submit an agent authorization letter template, which is an agent authorization letter. To concerning the offerer. And this must include a signature of the company employee who is authorized to sign or bind the company on behalf of the principal. Sandra? Okay, so now that you've gotten the letter of authorization and your um, authorized negotiators, what's next? Pricing proposal. Pricing proposal is also a template that is found in the solicitation. The directions for it are found in the README first. It is an Excel spreadsheet and it has a variety of tabs that have, for example, products, services, software, depending on what you're proposing that will determine which, which of the tabs that you populate. And as I indicated that the README first tab does provide additional additional instructions. In addition to that pricing proposal, you will need a commercial price list and a commercial sales practices format, an economic price adjustment mechanism, which basically is just a narrative of which economic price adjustment clause you'd like to tie your pricing to labor category matrix and descriptions. Some of these depending, are dependent upon what SIN you're proposing. So for example, um, labor category matrix, well, if you're, if you're proposing products, there's no need for a labor category matrix. Um, can, employee compensation plan also is if you're proposing one of the services. And also you would need to supply supporting additional supporting documentation such as invoices. Next slide, please. Country of origin, which was previously covered, ensure that the products being manufactured are, are manufactured in TAA compliant countries. As Gail indicated before, um, the list does change periodically, so it is important for you to prior the offer, it's important for the offer to prior to submitting, ensure that the products which are being manufactured are being manufactured in countries that are TAA compliant. So no, um, no products from North Korea, China, Russia, um, none of those things. And where services comes into play is if you're utilizing labor, if you're proposing labor categories, but your workforce is outside of the continental United States. Next slide, please. So the running theme is documentation, documentation, documentation. There's some documentation that is required the, the SINs that are being proposed drives most of the accompanying documentation. So for this factor, this is the first opportunity this pertains to services. Within a two page document, you're going to indicate the years of re relevant experience, organizational structure, brief history of the organization and how the company can go about acquiring additional resources that may be needed. In addition, if you're awarded a contract, if the offer is awarded the contract, then what we also want to know is, okay, once awarded, what is the marketing plan? How will you go about 
marketing the fact that you now have a GSA scheduled contract, the services that you're providing, how will you go, go about marketing whatever innovative solutions and strategies that you are willing, you are in a position to offer to the government. Next slide, please. Next, past performance. So when it comes to past performance, um, there are some companies that perform strictly with the federal government, some, some companies who perform um, commercially for commercial customers and some, some companies who do a little of both. And so we can accommodate either one. The procedure is slightly different because if you have um, performed, let's say for commercial customers, if all the work has been for commercial customers, then you utilize a questionnaire, past performance questionnaire. If there is proprietary information, if it's, you can, it can be sent directly to GSA uh, and marked proprietary information. Or let's say that you have done a lot of federal work. So the company, if you have um, a CPARS, if you have reports in CPARS, you can indicate that. And then GSA can go ahead and access and leverage those reports directly from CPARS. We need a minimum of three past performance evaluations. And the one additional thing, the questionnaires are valid for a year. Um, we also would like you to, if there is any kind of negative, if something goes wrong, if there's a, a hiccup, a stumble, you're late for whatever reason, we, we know that projects, you your desire, the company desires to some, be able to perform the work on time within budget, but we also understand that things happen. So this is the opportunity where you can indicate what sort of mitigating circumstances occurred, what action was taken in order to mitigate those situations, what and basically, this is your op the opportunity to be able to say, okay, things, yes, some unforeseen events occur, but this is how we mitigated it. This is how we got things back on track. And I think Isabella wants to discuss some additional common mistakes. Yes, so the past performance information. The company's past performance is one indicator of an offer's ability to perform the contract successfully. Offers must demonstrate a pattern of relevant successful past performance and must submit one of the following past performance requirements. So the CPARS offers with three or more contract performance assessment reports that represent contracts or orders completed within the three years of the date of offer submission at least three distinct orders and contracts and work similar in scope to the product or services included in the solicitation. Don't submit furniture orders if your proposal is for supplying IT hardware or software, for an example, or the past performance questionnaire. This questionnaire is to be completed by your customer, which demonstrates past performance is similar in scope and complexity to the work solicited under the proposed SIN for ongoing projects or projects within three years of your e-offer submission. Offerers are advised that GSA may contact a customer reference to discuss the information provided by a customer. Past performance information, as we're still talking about, the company's past performance is one indicator of an offer's ability to perform the contract successfully, as I stated below. And um, the CPARS is an example of this, which is what the offer will provide. Sandra? Okay, quality control. Picking back up from past performance, um, understanding that things happen. So we know it is the intent of the offer to always submit the highest quality of product or service possible. With the quality control and quality assurance, this is the opportunity for you to be able to share the narrative with respect to how that process is going to be achieved. 
So maybe, for example, there is one designated individual, maybe you have um, a team, quality assurance team, maybe there are various checks that have to go on in order for the product or service to be complete. That would ensure that the highest level of quality, the highest level of quality is adhered to at all time. In addition, the narrative should discuss how quality assurance can be maintained in the event of, let's say there has to be um, urgent requirements. So there's a rush, your schedule is suddenly compressed. A month long schedule suddenly compressed into a week. How would that go? How would that be handled in, in terms of not losing any of, the, any of the top quality caliber of product or service? Or let's say there are numerous products, projects that are being conducted at any given time. How do you ensure that each of the products is able to enjoy the same level of the same level of quality assurance, regardless, doesn't matter whether it's time, doesn't matter the scope, the, you know, how large or small it is, how quick the turnaround is, when this is the opportunity for you, for the company to discuss how, what mechanisms are in place in order to ensure high quality at all times. Also, this particular one applies to large business concerns. If there is a subcontractor, you there's a subcontracting plan, you have subcontractors, how do you go about monitoring their performance? Because the quality assurance needs to be excellent regardless, whether you're talking about the prime, the, the subcontractor, the quality needs to remain the same. So this is where that would be discussed. And I believe Isabel would like to discuss some additional areas where there are common mistakes. Yes, for the relevant project experience, this is an opportunity for you to showcase the excellent work you are doing in the market space. A narrative is required for each proposed service in when proposing services. Relevant projects must be within the last two years and not exceed four pages per project. Each description must clearly indicate the SIN to which it applies and identify the specific services being proposed under that SIN. The two projects can be completed or ongoing projects similar in size and complexity to the effort contemplated herein and in sufficient detail for the government to perform an evaluation. Each project description must also address the following elements, the customer or client name, project name, contract number, customer point of contact, telephone number and email address, the project performance period, the dollar amount of the contract, and a detailed description of same relevant work performed and the results that were achieved. How the work performed is similar in scope and complexity to the work solicited under the proposed SIN as well. Demonstration of required specific experience under the proposed SIN, including an explanation of any delays. The project schedule, and demonstration of compliance with any applicable laws, regulations, executive orders, on B circulars, or professional standards. Next slide, please. For each proposed labor category, the offer must provide a detailed position description. Position descriptions must include functional responsibilities, minimum years of experience, minimum education and degree requirements and any applicable training or certification requirements. If it is the offer of standard commercial practice to substitute experience for education, explain the methodology and use. For each proposed labor category, the offer must provide a detailed position description. Position descriptions must include functional responsibility, minimum years of experience, minimum educational degree requirements, and any applicable ex substitute experience. And then for education, explain the methodology and use of years that equates to the experience. Sandra? Okay. So factor four, this is an opportunity for you as the company to 
discuss where and how the work that you performed applies specifically to this and that is being proposed. So what you would do is submit the narrative that addresses the project name, the description, the dollar amount of the contract, the duration, point of contact and phone number, and Isabel, back to you. Sandra, we're on um, technical, technical evaluation guidelines now. Oh, okay. okay. Mm, got it. All right. All right. So, technical evaluation. So, in addition to what has previously been discussed with respect to the evaluation and the factors, there are some special item numbers that require additional documentation. These doc, this, these SINs are, for example, um, the HACS SIN and the cloud SIN. So for those SINs, they need additional evaluation. So what you would do is su supply the pricing proposal. along with which specific platform you'd like to utilize for cloud computing. Software as a service, platform as a service, those are the, the criteria that you can utilize when um, proposing cloud. For hacks, hacks requires a, an oral evaluation. So what needs to be done is you can, determine, you can designate up to five individuals or key personnel who will be responsible for um, con helping to conduct the orals for the HACS environment. Um, they are scheduled at a first come first serve basis. So um, it's important to get that done as quickly as possible. As soon as you know that um, you're going to be proposing HACS, then um, also understand that that is a requirement that will also have to be met prior to the contracting officer being able to proceed with the offer. You can use you and the things, the elements of hacks that you can propose. High value asset assessments, risk vulnerability, and penetration testing, innovation, incident response, and also cyber hunt. Next slide, please. Okay. Pricing proposal. Essentially what the pricing proposal is, is a spreadsheet that determines where you would put in, depending on the product, service, software, um, that would determine, as I said previously, which of the tabs should be utilized. So it is SIN specific. It also is going to contain your GSA discount, the discount that you're proposing to your most favorite customer, whether or not there's a discount to your most favorite customer, who they are. This does not apply if, if you're proposing TDR. One other thing that I wanted to add is within the documentation, within the um, pricing proposal, when you're indicating the price, what you will do is also list the price with and without the IFF. Um, also, you'll do the commercial price, price. So you have commercial price, then price to GSA without IFF and price to GSA with IFF and who the most favorite customer is. Isabella, turning it over to you. 
Thank you, Sandra. Now let's take a look at the required price proposal templates for all proposed products and services. There are two separate templates. One is specific for products and I would first see the README tab and then um, for complete instructions. You must ensure all cells are filled in, empty cells are not accepted, columns that include drop down options are used and must not be altered, and no formulas can be altered. Next slide. Thank you. Another common mistake is missing or incorrect commercial price list or internal market rate sheet that is applicable to both product, products and services. This document shows the prices you provide to commercial customers. We use these documents as a starting point to evaluate your company's pricing. The price list should be a standalone document with the company's name. Effective date in the company's current commercial or market rates. This is not the proposed GSA price list and there should not be a reference to GSA on the company's price list. If we do not have a commercial price list, please provide a market rate sheet if your firm maintains one. If proposed pricing is based on a published or publicly available commercial price list, please submit a copy of the company's current dated price list catalog or standard rate sheet. This must be an existing standalone document and not prepared for purposes of this solicitation. Next slide. Offers number of employees, experience in the field, and resources. This is the slide we're going to be covering. If you're proposing labor categories, you will need to make sure the number of proposed labor categories are adequate to the company's employees. There are two areas that you will add the offers numbers of employees information. First, on the SAM entity registration page under size metrics, and second is the technical proposal document e offer under the section that addresses corporate experience. Something we take into consideration is the number of proposed labor categories versus the number of employees. For an example, if a company is proposing 200 labor categories and the tech proposal and SAM lists three employees, this is an immediate red flag to us. This brings into question whether the offer's number of employees, experience in the field and resources available will enable them to fulfill potential GSA customer requirements. The offer should have enough resources in-house or ability to acquire the types of services proposed. If you are proposing labor categories, you will need to make sure the number of proposed labor categories are adequate to the company's information. First, on the SAP entity registration page under size and metrics, as I discussed earlier. Sandra? Okay. Um, commercial, commercial sales practices format. So what this is, is a document that contains, gives, what this is, my apologies, is a document that lets us know and details business practices. This document basically is going to tell us who your customers are, which class of customers you conduct business with, are any discounts offered? And then what discounts are being offered to GSA? Are there any quantity or volume discounts that are gonna be offered? Did you offer any to your most favorite customer under work, what circumstances? And are you proposing the same ones to GSA given the same circumstances? It is important to know that a commercial sales practices format has to be um, prepared for each SIN being proposed. So if there are five special item numbers being proposed, then there needs to be five CSPs. Isabella, back to you. Thank you, Sandra. The commercial sales practice form will be reviewed for completeness and is not applicable for TDR. One of the solicitation documents that you were required to upload includes the commercial sales practice. We use this document to verify that you're offering your best price to the government. 
what we call your most favorite customer. GSA's pricing goal is to obtain equal to or better than the offer's most favorite customer pricing. Depending on your SIN, we may require you to submit more documents. We'll ask for them after we've assigned a contracting officer to review your offer. Templates are provided in some cases for reference. Use the following information to complete each item of the form. Customer. Customer is the customer or category of customer who received the terms being disclosed. Discount. Provide any basic discount offer to this customer. A basic discount is any discount offer without regard for quantity. If you do not offer any basic discounts, you will insert none. The quantity volume. Provide any quantity or volume discounts offered to this customer. For example, a discount of 10% is offered when 20 units or more are purchased. Or a discount of 10% is offered when the net order exceeds $20,000. This discount is exclusive of any basic discount offer. So now the FOB terms. Provide the FOB terms offered to this customer. For example, FOB origin, FOB origin freight prepaid and allowed, or FOB destination. And concessions. Provide any other terms or conditions not previously listed which are offered to this category of customer. For example, any prompt payment terms, aggregate discount offered, enhanced or additional services offered. The reason I added the one and two items listed below was to remind offers to ensure that the information that you provide is consistent throughout all documentation. For instance, the commercial sales practice information in reference to the most favorite customer and discount offered to the most favorite customer should be the same information that is listed on your price proposal template. In the commercial or market um, price list should be the same prices insert in column N. Sandra? Okay. So, Startup Springboard, what about you have a company, but maybe the company is young? And so you're thinking, oh no, we don't have an opportunity, we can't. Um, if there's a company, a young company that is less than two years old, then Startup Springboard might be an excellent fit. So for example, um, clearly with a company that is six months old, they're not gonna have the prerequisites for the past performance, the previous experience, any of those things. So for some special item numbers, um, Springboard, you can be eligible for Springboard if you are a company who is less than two years old. Um, there are some special item numbers that do not lend themselves, like for example, hacks. Um, they do not lend themselves to being able to be utilized by the Springboard initiative. And so therefore those ones are not offered. Primarily, um, what Springboard does is allows personnel to substitute, key personnel to substitute their previous experience rather than the company experience. Because clearly, if the company is three months old, six months old, you don't have those prerequisites. And so you can instead utilize the experience of the key personnel. So the executives, the vice presidents, the partners, the managing directors, um, those those people may have 25, 30 years worth of experience in a particular sin, like IT professional services 54151. So Springboard allows you to make that substitution. In addition, when it comes to financial responsibility, you may not have the full two years of financial statements, but whatever the financial documentation is that you do have, then you would go ahead and include that as part of your offer package and you would be eligible for um, springboard. So you start off by indicating it in the offer responses as Isabella indicated previously, it's about consistency. So you indicate that you're interested in proposing under the springboard initiative and that waives a lot of the, the standard requirements. But then when it comes to actually submitting the offer package for the springboard initiative, 
then you would include, you would substitute the key personnel's experience, and you would also submit whatever financial documentation that the company has. Understanding that the contracting officer may come back and ask for additional documentation. Utilizing the Springboard initiative allows our younger companies to introduce technology that may be valuable to the government. It gives them potentially access to over $15 billion a year uh, annually, which is our federal um, market space. And there's a link for the Startup Springboard page if you'd like to um, visit that for additional information. Next slide, please. Fast lane. Okay, so we have a, a great many initiatives. GSA is known, we're known for our initiatives. And so just as we have startup springboard for the younger companies, we have fast lane to expedite fast track offers. So what it does is it allows, if you are eligible for Fastlane, again, not every cent is applicable, but if you submit an offer under the Fastlane track, it allows the offer to be evaluated more quickly. That in turn then gives the government access, quicker access to innovative solutions and strategies that the company is, is proposing. The off, under the fast lane initiative, offers can be awarded in as few as 45 days. But there are specific eligibility requirements that have to be met in order to be considered for fast lane. If you are interested in the fast lane initiative, um, the link at the bottom of this slide also provides additional information. Isabella, back to you. Thank you, Sandra. So as Sandra was saying, if the preponderance of work for your offer of the contract is not under this category, then you may skip this step. If your offer is fastly eligible, which is IT related, in the offer response document, there will be an option to ask you if this offer meets the criteria to, to um, participate in Fastlane. If your offer meets the criteria and you have submitted the fast lane checklist, then you would select option yes and click save. For more information to be eligible for fast lane, you must provide proof of an agency request for quote, which is the RFQ, and the following current initiatives are fast lane eligible. The Defense Health Agency Enterprise IT Services, to get second generation information technology IT BPAs awardees will be allowed to submit modifications for processing under the fast lane using the fast lane tab in FSS online. Other information technology initiatives are identified to GSA by the customer that may arise. If a federal agency ordering activity requests in writing that vendors may participate in fast lane to support the agency's current information technology requirements. Vendors are required to add the attached document along with the e-offer package. Failure to provide the required information could lead to your offer or GSA modification being removed from the fast lane process. In addition to the checklist and meeting the requirement for a fast lane proposal, the offer must indicate in the e-offer system that they meet the criteria to participate in fast lane. Fast lane eligibility checklist. Does offer qualify for fast lane, which is something that would be a question on the checklist. Failure to provide the required information, as I stated um, previously, could lead to your offer either being rejected or removed from the fast lane eligibility. And I'll pass it on to Sandra. Okay. So now what? So you've submitted your offer and you're with bated breath and you're, oh my goodness, what, what now? Once the offer is submitted, it will be assigned to a contract specialist or a contracting officer 
who will be evaluating the offer. We recommend that you reach out, introduce yourself to the contracting officer or specialist. Be sure that you respond to all correspondence as quickly as possible. Um, because one of the criteria that is being evaluated is responsiveness. So how quick the turnaround is for you to um, submit the revisions, clarifications, what have you, that is essential. And now I am handing it over to Ryan. Good, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> so do I have control over this? Let's see, I'm gonna share my screen here. Here, Ryan, I'm gonna stop and then I'll, I'll let you. Okay. And then, and actually I'm gonna have you, you share this, the slide, but I'm going to pull up one thing really quick to kind of wrap up what you guys were talking about really, uh, really quickly. Uh, a really good resource for to cover everything that they covered. Really, if you type in GSA Mass Roadmap in Google, and I'm hearing an echo here. Let me see if I could. But the, the first thing that comes up, you'll see uh, steps one through seven, and it really gives you a detailed step-by-step -step process and um, also gives you all the templates and documents that they covered uh, that will help any vendor who's trying to sign up as a GSA vendor. Um, that will give them kind of everything they need, step-by-step -step, uh, roadmap to, to getting on schedule. Um, so save, I'm going to put this into the chat, save this, uh, share this with everyone that come and ask, comes and asks, how do I become a GSA multiple award schedule vendor? This is their, uh, their step-by-step -step process here. Um, and then just, just uh, check, everyone can hear me, correct? Yep. And then and then Gail, I'm sorry, can can you actually pull up I'm going to can you pull up the slides one more time and I, I'll let you do the slides and then I'll uh, I'll I'll grab my screen again. Thank you. OK, so a, a couple last things I did want to share. I think I have two or three slides and then I'm going to show you a couple websites and then we'll be done here. And thank you guys for all your your time this morning. Um, the first thing I wanted to highlight is the market research as a service. This is something that everyone should be aware of, um, and you should be highlighting this to every vendor that comes through your office or everyone that you guys talk to on the phone. Um, it's been a huge success. Um, it's really getting a lot of agencies coming to GSA um, and working with us. What this is, any agency could could call me or anyone in our office and say, hey, I have this upcoming requirement. Um, here's the statement of work. Could you guys provide us with a report? Can you guys uh, let us know if this is a good fit for any GSA contract vehicle? Can you let us know if there's any interested and capable GSA contract holders, any industry partners out there that are both capable and interested? Can you let us know the socioeconomic uh, breakdown of those vendors for, and that would let the customer know, could they do this as a small business set aside? Could they do this as a woman owned or a veteran owned set aside or a hub zone set aside, et cetera. Um, so we provide them with all that data. We provide them with um, the industry feedback. So a lot of times the industry will come back and say, hey, we think this would be a better fit under this in or this category or this contract vehicle or hey we have some confusion with um this part of the statement of work uh have you thought about doing it this way um <clears throat> also all all the industry partners upload their capability documents onto this um and then the agencies could could 
pretty much ask any question they want, any technical question they want in any type of format, yes, no, multiple choice, short answer. And then GSA does all the reach, reach outreach on behalf of the, of the agency. We do all, we, uh, we post it. Um, all the vendors just get an email to their email box. They click on the link, they fill out a, essentially a Google form. Then we compile all that data. And then you could, I, I'll show you another example here in a few minutes, but uh, you could see on this PowerPoint slide, there's uh, those four slides there on the bottom right as an example uh, that we provide back to the customer. Um, and then they're able to tell quickly um, what type of, you know, in this in this example, there was a lot of vendors responded, uh, that, you know, 40 plus. That's that, that's definitely high um, and not not. I would say uh, more than than usual, but um, you know they would quickly be able to tell. Yeah, that there'd be more than enough interest. We would get more than enough uh, quotes if we posted RFQ, and they could even be kind of choosy on on which vendors they would post an RFQ to um, if you know if they wanted to move forward and post something to eBuy. Um, really, the only thing I wanted to highlight on this. Tell your vendors that the customers and agencies are really looking at these. Uh, they're using these to decide uh, who's getting the RFQs. Um, so let them know, respond to these whenever they come out. Um, they are being utilized. It's it's an important factor in the process of, of who's getting selected ultimately for these awards. Uh, next slide. So eBuy, um, the only thing I'll mention here, because I am going to pull this up on the website here in a second. Um, so after the market research process and the, those reports that I just kind of was highlighting on the previous slide, if there is sufficient and qualified vendors that we find while we're helping them with the market research, the agency can then go to this website called eBuy and post the actual RFQ with their statement of work and then post it to the correct vendor sins that we were all just learning about over the last hour. Um, like if it was an ITC category, post it to one of those subcategories under ITC, and then um, post it to a certain group of vendors. And then those vendors could respond right there in the in the eBuy website module with their quotes and the vendor, and then the customer could review those within the website and then ultimately reward it, award it um, um, in there after doing their technical evaluation. I, at least notify the vendors that it, who they're awarding it to. Um, customers can do both RFI and RFQ in there in, in this website, but primarily I would say it is used for RFQs. Um, especially now that we have the MRAS Market Research as a Service program that's outside of eBuy. Uh, next slide. There might be one more. Um, so yeah, what what is eBuy used for? So it's used for quotes, uh, obtaining obtaining uh, volume discounts beyond contract pricing, uh, complex requirements or combinations of products and services. Uh, determining sources of supply. So like I just said, you can do RFIs in there. Uh, it's used for that less uh, now so. Um, and then obtaining quotes directly against BPAs as well. So if a customer did put together a BPA, they could use that to get uh, BPA quotes if it was a multiple award schedule uh, BPA um, that they put together. Next slide, that might be the last one. And then that's the homepage of eBuy that I'll show you here in one second. Next slide. <clears throat> um, that was the last one, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna share my screen again and then show you guys a few other websites and then we'll finish this up. So again, here's the roadmap. I put that in the chat box. Definitely star that, favorite that website. Another one I'm going to have everyone favorite right now because it's really important is the GSA eLibrary website. I'm going to put this in the, the chat box. So definitely favorite these two. Um, just 
really quick because uh, we don't have too much time. But here are all those categories that were being discussed. I, I mean, I guess for the most part, we just talked about the IT category today. Um, but here are all the, the categories that GSA has under the multiple award schedule. Um, if you click on any one of these, we'll get into the subcategories. We'll kind of just stay focused on IT since that's what we talked about earlier today. And then if we keep going down levels, we go to those subcategories like hardware, service, software, solutions. Um, so if we clicked on the IT hardware. Um, then we'll get down to the final subcategories on this website. <clears throat> this is a, a relatively um, broad and large category, but purchasing of new electronic equipment. You could see all the vendors that have a uh, schedule or contract under the multiple award schedule under this this uh, 33411 category. And then you could see all the contractor terms and price lists. Um, all the vendors' names, contact information. If you wanted to view uh, what products they had on the GSA Advantage website, you could click here and that would take you to the GSA Advantage website. I'm not going to really get into that uh, due to time limitations, but this is almost like the GSA quote unquote Amazon um, type website or government Amazon type website uh, that does have more pictures and um, pricing in there. Um, remember, whether you're talking about this website or you're looking at the, ter the terms and conditions price list, all these pricings are ceiling rates. Um, so when, when these contracts are being put together um, and these, these vendors are putting together these contracts and doing the, the terms and conditions, they're, they're putting their ceiling rate pricings um, and doing agreements based on their ceiling rate pricings. So all these websites have ceiling rate pricings. Um, when when actual RFQs go out, they're generally bidding under the pricing that's showing in here. Um, but if we clicked on a random vendor on here, some of these terms and price lists are, are better than others, um, but you could see uh, what, what this vendor has. They have year subscription for management console alarm system and their ceiling rate for uh, whatever this manufacturer part number is. So just because like a, if a customer was needing whatever this is, they could see what the ceiling rate price was for this product description. Another thing that it might come in handy is if you were working with a vendor who was trying to sign up for the GSA multiple award schedule contract um, and they had to put together their own terms and price list and they they were falling under this uh, purchasing of new electronic equipment, maybe have them kind of source some of these terms and price lists of, of their quote unquote competition and kind of use these as a guide of, okay, this is what uh, vendors have already been approved. Maybe I could kind of look at these as examples of, of vendors that got approved and um, kind of use those as as templates or ideas for when I'm um, putting together my own. Um, if there's any questions as I'm kind of quickly going through this, just you know, uh, raise your hand or put them in the chat box. Um, but again, that, that's all I'm going to really show on this website. Um, yeah, just key takeaways. Again, uh, here are the the large categories you kind of uh, hone in by by clicking on these, um, and then once you once you do get into whatever category that you're you're working with a vendor on um, these terms and conditions can be helpful when uh, you're working with a new vendor who's trying to put their own terms and conditions price list together um, the other one that i'll quickly highlight if you click on this mass available offerings um, you'll get a excel uh, uh, template or excel sheet that that is a crosswalk for uh, the the multiple award schedule sins to the NAICS codes, so that that could be helpful if your vendors know what NAICS code they fall under, but they're not sure what the corresponding GSA sin numbers were. So so you could go around in here and try to like figure it out, but this crosswalk right here under under mass available offerings is very helpful as well. 
Um, so that mass available offerings um, is a good um, kind of uh, helpful Excel sheet for in that case as well. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. <laughs> And the echo again. Echo again. Okay, so the last thing I did want to quickly show was GSA e buy. Let's see if I could log in really quickly. And Ryan, we are coming up on time. So if you could do that quickly, it's, it's 12.25. Okay, yeah, okay. I'll just yeah, I'll be just in here like one minute here. Like one minute here. Sure. So this is the GSA eBuy module. Uh, you could log in as either a vendor or as a customer. Um, I log in as a customer. Um, as a customer, you would come to the home page, you would prepare an RFQ, you would type in your the SIN number of the customers you're trying to get <laughs> you're trying to get to. Or the same thing in in eLibrary, that other website we were just in. You would type on, you would type in, you know, what subcategory of the vendors you're trying to find, and then you would you would you would upload your statement of work and choose the vendors you're trying to post the RFQ to, and then ultimately you'd post the RFQ. Here are a couple examples, and um, the vendors would be able to log in under their their vendor side. And they would uh, be able to upload their quotes for you know whatever you're posting, and then ultimately the customer could come back in, do their technical review, and then click on awarded for for the awarded vendors, and then um, there would be a system generated you know awarded non awarded email that goes out to all the vendors that responded. So it is a nice way and there's less emails back and forth for both the customers and vendors. Everyone gets notified all within the system. Um, and that's that's kind of the purpose of eBuy. Um, always happen to, happy to kind of go in a little bit more detail um, if needed, but that's in a nutshell what the purpose of this website is for. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of stop it there. So, but yeah, uh, please feel free to reach out with any questions. And I think at the end, uh, we have everyone's contact information. Thanks so much, Ryan, Gail, Sandra, and Isabella for the wealth of information. Uh, let's see what question has come in from our attendees. Uh, Michelle and Yolanda, can you tell us what has come in? Say it again, Antoine. I can't hear you. You're very low on my end. Yolanda, can you tell us what question has come in? I don't have any questions on my end. Michelle, did you receive any? We have a hand up, Veronica. Not a problem, Not thank a problem. you. I'll send it out. This is Michelle. I can't see the question. If you guys can read the question, I could answer that. Where there's a question there says is the question is where can we download the slides? Oh, um, Antoine, would you send slides over to the APEC? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Veronica, you, I think you have the slides and you'll be able to distribute them out. That's correct. That's I will correct. be sending the we'll slides, send out, slides to out to everyone after the, after, the, after today's, after today's training. training. Great. Perfect. Thank and you. Next, what is the what next question? Is there another? That was the only question that I saw in the chat. Yeah, this oh, perfect. question oh, perfect. came in. Great. Great job, great any job. Other, any other questions? 
Great presentation. Thank you all. Any other questions? There's one more There's hand one up. More I don't know if they have a question. question. Uh, I don't see a question here. I think they were, saying, they were saying someone's saying hand, was up. hand was up. Yeah, excellent information and, and slide presentation. Thank you to all. Thank you. Thank you for that information. There's a hand yeah. raised. Do we have a question? It says unknown user, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't see a. I don't see a. Question that was there. me. Uh, this is Michelle. I accidentally touched the wrong key, so okay. I don't have. A I don't have that was. Yeah, that was a question. Okay. All right. Well, I would like to say thanks again uh, to the presenters and for the wealth of information and for this very inform informative discussion. Um, the, the audience question in the Q&A that we did not have time to address, and of course we didn't have any more questions, which uh, is great, will be posted on our NAA FAQs after the training at our GSA Interact website at interact.gov.gsa.gov, along with a copy of today's presentation will be posted and a webinar recording in the next few weeks. If you would like additional assistance or have any further questions, please reach out to Michelle Chandler, michelle.chandler at gsa.gov and or yolanda.collins at gsa.gov. And if you would Ferguson. like to know more. Yolanda.ferguson. Okay. Yolanda.Ferguson, I apologize, <laughs> at gsa.gov. And if you would like to know more about uh, additional training, please check out our website at www.gsa.gov or forward slash events. Thanks again for taking the time to join us today. Have a great day. Thank you all.